uh, maybe after, if, you, uh, if we have a little bit of time, you can always come up to Dr. Ware and ask him any more questions and all of that, all right? So let's start, um, Dr. Ware, with um, uh, a question on sanctification. Okay. Um, here's a question on sanctification. I'm very thankful to go to a church that teaches the Word so very well. I serve and I know a lot myself about the, the Word, and yet I find myself lonely and overwhelmed, to be honest, at the point of pulling into myself. Um, yeah, I know pretty lame, but I'm struggling. What attribute of the Father or Jesus can encourage me in this season? Well, you know, I, I would think there are a number of attributes that would be, you know, encouraging um, God's faithfulness. You know, people disappoint, uh, even, even the best of them at times do, but God never, never does. He always is with you and for you. If you're, if you're a believer, I'm assuming you're a believer in this case, you know, so God is with you and for you and will never, ever fail you. Um, I, th I think that, you know, the teaching, we looked at a passage actually in the men's conference from Isaiah 43 where God declares, I am with you, you know, and that mm -hmm. statement, I am with you, is not merely that he just is there, but he's there with his power, with his wisdom, with his, uh, with, with his love and kindness and mercy and providing everything for you that you would need in a particular situation. So, I mean, you know, other attributes like the wisdom of God, the, the power of God um, are ones that provide tremendous confidence that God can help us in our times of need. Um, but, you know, I, I'm just thinking of, of the background of your question, and it seems to me that part of the answer to this, too, is... Uh, seeking out relationships with others here in the body, because we're not, we're not solo Christians. God doesn't intend us to live the Christian life, me and my Bible and my God, and that's it. You know, that's not what God intends, but rather the community together. Uh, and so people um, who can help us uh, think, of, think correctly, pray with us, encourage us, uh, maybe help in particular concrete ways that would be needed. So I would think body life, body uh, fellowship would be a very important thing to pursue mm -hmm. for this, this person who asked this question. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and through that, again, th think of the sermon this morning. Uh, God designed so much of what he has for each one of us to come through others. He could have designed it so that we just all sit on the sidelines and watch him work, you know, but instead he calls us into the game, as it were, you know, and to be participants. And so it's through others that we oftentimes experience what God has for us. And uh, so don't, don't, you know, s neglect the, the, uh, the assembling of yourselves together, mm -hmm. you know, stimulating one another to love and good deeds, Hebrews tells us. So uh, I think that's part of it. Um, okay, let me say one more thing. I just, you know, on this question of what, what from God, I, I have often given a talk, I've given this talk many, many times, that, that talks about what, what attributes of God ground our trust in Him. Because I think that's ultimately what you have to have is a, is a rock-solid trust in God. And I liken it to a three-legged stool where you have to have all three legs all three have to be strong in order to uphold uh, you, you sitting on the stool. And there are three, three attributes in particular that are really important for trust in God. One, one is to have a deep confidence in the love of God for you, that you know that he is for you, not against you. If you doubt God's love for you, you will not trust him. I can just declare that to you straight out because you'll... you'll um, you know, you don't, you don't go to one for help if you think they're not, not for you. So you have to have a confidence in God's love, and if you think, well, how, how do I get that? Well, think of passages like Romans 8.32, mm -hmm. he who did not spare his, his only son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not with him freely give us all things? Who, who will separate us from the love of God in Christ? So that Romans 8 would be a great passage to meditate through mm -hmm. to be reassured of God's love for you. Uh, the second one, the second leg of the stool is wisdom. You have to be confident that God knows what is best. If you know he, he loves you and has the, you know, the, the strongest 
longings for your well-being, but you're, you're not confident that he knows what is best for you, you still won't trust him, right? So you have, you have to be just totally confident that God's wisdom is unsurpassable. None of us can know what God knows or, or put it together, put that knowledge together, make use of that knowledge in a way that designs perfectly what is best for our lives other than God. So to have confidence in his wisdom, his ways are best, um, he, he cannot be questioned in terms of what, what he has um, ordained for our lives and, and to, to sort of follow in his ways cannot be improved upon. So that confidence, so, so the love of God, the wisdom of God, and then the last one is the power of God. So if he, you know, if he has the deepest desires for your well-being in love, he knows the best thing to do, but then he can't, he can't pull it off, well then you're not gonna trust him either, right? So you've gotta, you've gotta know that he has power to bring to bear, to bring about, and he, he cannot be stopped, he cannot be thwarted. Uh, he, he, he will accomplish what he has chosen in this. So those, those three, I think, are really important to just remind yourself regularly of God's love for you, that he, he is the infinitely wise one, we're not, his ways are right, and he has power to accomplish anything that he chooses. Those are just bedrock, I think, for living a life uh, that is marked by trusting the Lord and finding, you know, finding in him what we need. Amen. I love your focus, your emphasis on the vertical and uh, God's love for us, but then also one uh-huh. of the primary means of grace is the church sure. and one another. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, from very practical to a, a deep Trinity question. Okay. All right. I, I, I told you before that we would have some questions uh, on the Trinity. Uh-huh. Is the essence shared by the persons of the Godhead personal or impersonal? Is the essence the same as the, as the triune God? If the triune God is personal, is he a fourth person in the Godhead? Yeah, so the essence of God or the nature, essence and nature are two ways of talking about the same reality. Uh, the nature of God is not personal. Uh, like your, your nature is not personal. It's personalized by, um, by the person who possesses the nature. And so it is with God. His nature is personalized by the persons, in this case, unlike us, singular, for him it's plural, the persons who possess the nature, the Father, Son, and Spirit. So know that nature is not a fourth person. You know, so, sometimes we talk of God as a person, and I understand, you know, lang- language is kind of tricky here, um, because you wanna, you wanna talk about him, God, as yeah. personal, mm-hmm. and so we use the language of a person, but that's actually not correct, he's tri-personal. He's tri- tri-person, tri- three, three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. He's not one person. So I don't, I don't know quite what's behind the question, but, but um, the, the nature of God, by the way, is, the, um, is that in God which comprises all of the essential attributes of God. So the na- nature of God contains his love and his holiness and his power and his goodness and his righteousness and justice. All the, all the essential attributes of God uh, comprise the nature of God and that one nature is possessed fully by the Father, fully by the Son, fully by the Spirit. So one nature, but three personal expressions of that one undivided divine nature. So the personal expressions, so, so nature and person, let me just take a minute on that. Mm-hmm. Um, nature is, is really correlates with, with noun, a noun like, like the attributes, right? Holiness, goodness justice, wisdom, righteousness. So na- nature correlates with, with nouns, person with verbs. Uh, that, that is, persons are the ones who act, who speak, who, um, who, who, who work out of the capacities of nature. So your nature, you have certain capacities within your nature, but then you as person choose to activate those capacities when you stand up, when you walk out of the room. Uh, if, but, but for example, you won't fly out of the room. Why? Because you don't have a capacity of nature to do that, right? Mm. So what we can do as persons is, is um, tied to, limited to, subject to the capacities of nature. And, and uh, 
So, so, to, so too it is with God. He, what, what he does as Father, Son, and Spirit is tied to the capacities of nature. Um, so, for example, God is truth in nature, so God cannot tell a lie, you know, we're, we're told in Scripture, uh, be, because he has an attribute of truth that cannot be other than it is. And uh, so God, God always then in his persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, utilizes those capacities of nature than to do the things that God does, as we see in Scripture, as the Father, Son, and the Spirit, the things that they do are mm-hmm. reflections of those capacities of nature. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, uh, the nature itself is not personal. The nature provides capacities for persons to use those capacities and function in the ways that we see. Mm-hmm. And you wrote a very helpful book. Father, Son, and Spirit. Right, right. With uh, kind of articulating a lot of, obviously, biblically faithful, pointing us back to Scripture that I think is very helpful if you want to read more on the, the wonderful, beautiful, our bright, beautiful triune God. I think that's a great book. I think one of our members mentioned that uh, yesterday. That, that was a blessing to their hearts. All right, this question is along the topics of mission, and by mission I mean the Great Commission. Mission and Gospel Proclamation. Uh, Most people today agree that we are living in a postmodern culture, Mm -hmm. and some even go further and say a a post-Christian culture. Uh So what are some encouragements and cautions you would give us as we witness to people about God, Christ, the gospel, et cetera, in this present culture? Uh, Yeah, well. It would be helpful, Doctor, if you can maybe define for us from your, in your Mm. own words, postmodernism, post-Christian, that terminology. Yes, yeah. okay. Um, postmodern, um, of course, raises, raises the question of what is modern? What, what is modernism? That now we're post, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're past that. And modernism is normally described as the time period of the Enlightenment uh, that, that came up to, you know, really, really affected up in, into the part of the 20th century, mm-hmm. um, where the main idea was we have given up our confidence in revelation from God, and we rely upon human reason Mm -hmm. to know what we know about this world. So it's, you know, the scientific revolution and and, uh, confidence that we we can become masters of uh, knowing what there is in the universe and so on by our own reason and ability to to study and, and so on, uh, was really the hallmark of modernism, a very, very confident approach toward human reason. Mm. But then, in postmodernism, there, there became this conviction that so much of what we claim to know was prejudiced by our backgrounds, by our cultural upbringing, by our situatedness, mm. uh, by our relative perspectives on things. And so a kind of perspectivalism, right? There are our pers- your perspective, my perspective, then colors the way I see things became the dominant conception. So instead of having confidence that we all can know the truth about the world through our use of reason, uh, we, we now realize I see the world my way and you see the world your way. And, and we all have our own take on things, my, my truth and your truth are different truths, you know? There is no absolute truth. And so there was this tremendous shift that took place in the middle of the 20th century on uh, to, to our present day toward relativism, uh, toward, toward a relative view of knowledge and of mm. understanding and the like. And so we live in a world now that any claim to know the truth is viewed as um, suspicious at best um, or um, just uh, j- wrong, wrong, just rejected altogether as wrong. Mm. So here, here we stand as Christian people who believe that God has given us the truth, and, and yet we you know, are trying to minister in a, in a culture that has rejected absolute truth. So this is where a lot of the, mm. the tension comes is endeavoring to do that. So I think a, cu- a couple things can be said in terms of how to try to minister in a postmodern uh, age, which also is post-Christian in that they've rejected Christian truth mm-hmm. as well as they've rejected all claims of absolute truth. Uh, what one is to just call into question the relativity of um, 
the notion of postmodernism by, by pointing out that there are many, many times where we all agree that certain things are wrong, you know, when massacres take place or the like, or terrorist attacks or the like. I mean, there is this, co this recognition culturally uh, that that's a wrong thing to do. What we don't say is, oh, well, they're just acting out of their perspective and they're doing what they think is the right thing to do. And so we, g we give them a pass on that. I mean, sometimes that happens, mm -hmm. sadly. But there are sometimes in our culture nationwide that we recognize, oh, that was wrong, you know? So there is built within us this this is Romans 2, this undeniable sense of right and wrong. We can try to deny it, but it's still there. So I think helping people come to terms with the fact that we all function out of uh, a sense of, of right and wrong, and this is absolute for all humanity, uh, then has to be accounted for. How, how do you account for that? And uh, by the way, a helpful resource on this is C.S. Lewis. Uh, his Mere Christianity and his book, The Abolition of Man, uh, uh, and some other things that he wrote are very helpful in tr trying to help us see that this sense of right and wrong cannot be dismissed by appeal to um, behavior modification or genetics or something like that, that it really, the only way it can be counted for is by God who created us, gave us this sense of moral right and wrong, and we, and we have it, we all have it. Every culture, uh, all people have that sense of right and wrong. So I think that's helpful to point that out. But then secondly, another, another thing besides helping kind of dispel the, the claim of relativism is to realize that the, the gospel is the power of God for salvation mm. for everyone who believes. And, and, and there's no asterisk there that says, oh, by the way, that doesn't work with postmodernists, <laughs> you know. It, it, it has this power to convict people when, when, they, when the Holy Spirit accompanies that proclamation of the gospel, they are given understanding of truth that they did not have before. And this is how conversion happens, isn't it? it it's not that, that we convince them uh, ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit opens their eyes to see the truth of their own sin, the truth of Christ, and they come. So honestly, at one level, there's no difference mm -hmm. in, in presenting the gospel to someone in a postmodern era as in a modernist era or pre-modern era. They're mm -hmm. people, uh, sinners, uh, upon the, whom the Holy Spirit works, and, uh, and they need to hear the gospel to be saved. And so we just, you know, believe mm -hmm. that that will happen. You know, I think a, a marvelous example of this is um, the conversion of Philip Johnson. Uh, I don't know if you know that name, but he became famous for a book that he wrote, Darwin on Trial. Uh, Philip Johnson was, a number of years ago, the head of the, the law department at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, uh, one of the most prestigious positions anywhere in America, in, in academia. And uh, he was going through a split uh, divorce with his wife. He had... Um, um, responsibility for one of their children at one point, took them to a, um, a vacation Bible school meeting that the child wanted to go to, and, uh, and then showed up there to pick up his child uh, early, sat in the back of the church, and heard this youth pastor explain the gospel to these children. He heard it, and two weeks later, he was saved. Mm -hmm. The head of the law department at Berkeley. Mm. I mean, it's just, you know, a phenomenal thing, isn't it? So you just realize, if you were kind of strategizing ahead of time, how would you present the gospel to, to Philip Johnson? <laughs> you know, it that's that not way. the way you would think of doing it, right? Mm. You know, take him to a child's gathering, you know, and a youth pastor telling them mm. the gospel. But, you know, it's the power of God for salvation. So I, I think we overthink it sometimes. And we realize it's really pretty simple. We're called to be faithful in proclaiming the truth. And, and, uh, when the Holy Spirit is at work in, in opening those people's eyes, they mm -hmm. see the truth and they come. And uh, so mm -hmm. that's where our confidence is ultimately. Mm -hmm. Let me say one more thing. Here, here's a danger. I think if we overthink what can we do, you know, to make the gospel understandable and relevant is sometimes that leads us to compromise the gospel, mm -hmm. right? Because we think, ah, oh, we want to remove as many obstacles as possible from accepting what we're saying, well, obstacles like what? 
Oh, you know, like, like, you know, wrath of God against our sin in Christ. You know, they won't like that idea. So let's get rid of that, you know. So we, we end up compromising truth of God's word in order, in order to make what we call the gospel, it no longer is, but we call the gospel, uh, make it more acceptable to people. And in the process, we compromise way too much. Mm-hmm. So uh, the, the main goal we should have uh, as we present the gospel is faithfulness to God's word mm-hmm. in presenting what God has given us. And, and um, yes, we, we do it in ways that we believe are clear and accurate and winsome, but we, we don't manipulate the, the content of it in order to try to make it more acceptable or less offensive. Uh, that's a huge mistake to do that. Yeah, it's really yeah. good. There's a tendency right now for a lot of compromising, including changing terminology. Yeah. Don't use biblical terminology because the unbeliever doesn't understand that, especially in this kind of culture. Uh, but I think what you're emphasizing is faithfulness to the gospel message, and it's got the power to save, right? Right. right. And, so. and you explain terminology if you need to, mm-hmm. you know? So Christ has redeemed you. They may not know what that means. Well, just tell them what it means. Mm -hmm. That's not hard. You know, so, yeah. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Ware. Okay, this one is a, um, we have a lot of, obviously, wonderful single people here. We also have a lot of married people. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, More and more young families, especially with young kids. And obviously, we have families with um, young adult kids and all of that, grandparents, all of that. So this is a a one along the lines of the family, Okay. So you kind of, you've talked a lot about your book, Big Truths for Young Hearts. It's a book obviously largely based upon your conversation with your girls, mm-hmm. with your little girls. Um, just for the sake of our congregation, I know you mentioned it to the men at the conference. Talk a little bit about the background of that book. And even from that then, the importance of theology in the lives of um, uh, our kids, young mm-hmm. or older. Okay, and even the father's role in that. Right. So maybe right. talk, uh, the question of you mentions Jody. Yes. You know, Jody's involvement in uh-huh. all that. Okay. Yeah, uh, bo- both Jody and I um, g- grew up in Christian homes ourselves, and we were so blessed for that reason. Uh, very committed Christian parents. And so both of us, when we entered into marriage and had children, we, we wanted to raise our kids, of course, in a way that, that they would know the Lord if, as God would show mercy to our children. And uh, I can remember as they began to grow, I, I realized I was not doing as, as much as Jody was in terms of training our children. She, she was homeschooling them. They were pretty, I mean, very young still, but she was homeschooling. And uh, I, mean, I, I was not doing a lot. We had family devotions fair, pretty, pretty regularly, almost every uh, dinner time. You know, when they're young, you can control their schedules. You know, when they get older, it's, you know, good luck with that, you know, so... <laughs> But um, we'd, we'd have family devotions, and I was doing something there. But I was driving home from, from Trinity, where I was teaching at the time, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, about a half-hour drive commute. And on my way, I was just, you know, reveling in the privilege I had to teach seminary students who were going to pastor and be missionaries and so on. But then I thought of my own girls, and I just was really burdened to get something going with them, and I didn't know what. Well, one night, we were putting them to bed, and I noticed they were, you know, didn't want to go to sleep. They were giggly, having fun, uh, and just weren't interested really in going to sleep, which happened often. Um, and so I thought, goodness, if they don't want to go to sleep, we fight this. Why, why don't we not fight it? And I'll, I'll, I'll just co-op that time with them, t- 10 or 15 minutes when we put them to bed, and, and begin teaching theology to them. So that's what I did. So uh, we just had two, so that made it a lot easier than if you have a larger family. But I spent about 10 or 15 minutes with each one at night, most nights. I, I didn't travel back then like I do now, and I was home most of the time. So I just began taking them through, uh, you know, verses of the Bible and, and, and tied to that doctrinal development um, of each of the doctrines of the Christian faith over about a 10-year period of time uh, in, in their, you know, at, at their bedtimes and uh, just would kneel down and we would have these little discussions. So that's the background to then the book that came out of that was largely because my two girls came to me later and they, they just were relentless in telling me, Dad, you've got to write this up. You know, the, these studies that we did uh, gr- growing up. Uh, my daughter, Rachel's name for the book was Bedside Theology that, that um, 
Crossway didn't take. They, they didn't take the title of because they thought it sounded like hospital visitation by a pastor. So there went that title. But but instead the title became Big Truths for Young Hearts. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that that book really does provide for parents a way of explaining uh, the doctrines of the faith to to children. In, in a way, I hope anyway, I tried very hard to make it understandable and mm-hmm. clear, mm-hmm. but I didn't dumb anything down. I mean, there's everything is in there, you know, mm-hmm. uh, with sin and judgment and hell, and I mean, just everything is there, mm-hmm. but it, it's presented in a simple way. Mm-hmm. And I do think it's really important for parents to work with their kids mm-hmm. in growing in knowledge of Bible content knowledge, and, and knowledge of theology. Mm-hmm. That, that's how, how you put together the Bible's teaching in those larger doctrinal areas, like who, who God is, what, who Christ is, what, what, the, what salvation is, what our sin is, you know, things like that, those larger doctrinal areas. And there are more resources for Bible, I think, out there for parents to use with their kids than there, there has been for theology, although there are more available now, I think, mm-hmm. even since I wrote Big Truths. But it, it's, it's really worth the effort to do. I mean, ultimately, parents bear the primary responsibility, not the church, with, with their children's you know, growth in the knowledge of the things of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Uh, pa- parents bear that. And more specifically, fathers have the primary responsibility before God. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is part of what was weighing on me back in those days when I was trying to think, what can I do? Because I realize I bear primary responsibility in, in the upbringing of our children uh, spiritually. And, and where do I get that from? Ephesians 6, where, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, two times, it's mom and dad together. So children, obey your parents. That's mom and dad. Honor your father and mother. That's mom and dad. But then the next verse, fathers. Do not, do not exasperate your children, but raise them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. So it's very clear he targets particularly the dad in the home to be the one who takes that responsibility to raise them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Mm-hmm. And so I, I would encourage dads out there, you know, to, to realize God gave this to us and we have it, you know, with our, with our children, a responsibility to do this. Mm-hmm. So I do think family devotions is a great, a great thing to do with them on a regular basis. Uh, some other time with them like I, I did might be a, a very good thing to do. Uh, and then, you know, times with them individually that you can do, uh, take, taking them on activities or whatever. But spending time in the midst of it talking about uh, matters of the heart, mm. uh, of, of their own relationship with the Lord and dealing with uh, issues of, of sin in their lives and are, are they growing in Christ? I mean, these are... Th- things that, um, that parents uh, need to be attentive to with their children. Mm-hmm. Yep. Can you expand a little bit, Dr. Ware, on obviously you have young parents with tiny little toddlers, yep. and we have parents that have young adults, right? Young men, young women. We call them teens in our culture, but they're young men and young uh-huh. women. And then we have obviously then they're out of the nest, so to speak. What are some practical helps, especially for the, those who have young children, because you know when you're when the kids are younger, it's easy. The father's trying to lead a family devotion. Kids picking his nose, uh-huh. hitting, pulling his sister's hair, doing all kinds of different things. Instead of that frustration that comes for some of the young parents and all of that, what are some helpful practical tips you would give, yeah. having experienced some of that with your daughters? Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, one one thing I think is um, consistency in doing it um, in, in your family devotions along with simplicity. I mean, I think those two are the um, k- kind of the, the main um, uh, criteria for success in this, mm-hmm. is, is a consistency and simplicity. What, what you don't want is to make it so complicated that it's hard for your kids to get this, to, to follow along. But mm-hmm. I, I would recommend, you know, for family devotions, just read uh, just one little paragraph from scripture or a, a portion of a psalm or something like that. And then ki- kind of on a regular basis, have them look together, have your kids join you in looking together for what we learn about God, what we learn about ourselves, um, what, what we're called to do, 
and what promises there might be, you know. So I think kind of in those categories, at least those are simple ones that you can work through. Not that every text would have all of those, but they're gonna have some of those in it, you know. And just help them see from Scripture things day by day by day that they would have a cumulative understanding of, a growing understanding of God, a growing understanding of ourselves before Him, both as, you know, created in His image, but fallen and sinful, um, of, of promises that God has for us and commands that He has for us. I think those are areas that we can be attuned to as we do that. So very, very simple um, and consistent. I think if you try to do too much, you won't be consistent. You'll give it up. You'll just say, you know what? That's just not working. And, and so we'll, we'll scrap it. Uh, mm-hmm. But boy, the, the, here, here's one of the huge advantages of the consistency with you is they see you, mom and dad, um, who love the word and love the Lord so much that you are doing this with them on a regular basis all the time. And they'll, they'll be able to tell your heart, you know, whether your heart is in this. They, 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 they are just very good readers, you know, of us as parents. They know us. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you, you love the Lord, you love the word, and you convey that. They'll pick up on that, and that'll be a, a really, you know, strong incentive for them mm-hmm. to want to follow in that as well. Mm-hmm. I love that simplicity and consistency because a lot of men, any of us, could get discouraged or think we're inadequate. Yeah. But it's amazing to remember that God has put you in that family and he gives you the grace to be able to do that, right? Absolutely. How did that that change as your girls got bigger for you and Jody? You guys continued consistent formal Mm -hmm. devotion, more informal. What did that look like for you guys? We, yeah, we, we, I mean, we kept the pretty simple thing in terms of our Bible part of our family devotional, and, and then we added over time more emphasis on prayer also, mm-hmm. and th- this was Jody's idea. It was a great idea. I mean, jo- Jody in our family has had so many good ideas. I, you know, I, I as, a, as a husband and father would have been an utter fool <laughs> if I had not been attentive to the good ideas that she had. I'm, we're so blessed because of, of uh, so many things that she has thought of over, over the years. This was one of her good ideas, was to have a prayer notebook, just a, uh, a three-ring binder, uh, you know, half-sheet binder, in which we would record prayer requests in blue ink, leave a gap, and then when the prayer was answered, we'd write the answer in, in red. Mm-hmm. And so we have two notebooks filled that we go back to from time to time and flip the pages, mm-hmm. you know, of... of prayer requests we had, and then all this red ink in there of ways in which God answered these prayers. It, it's just precious, you know. It's a mm-hmm. wonderful memorial to God's faithfulness to us. Mm-hmm. And so we, I mean, we just wanted to try to help our children value time in the Word, uh, time in fellowship, and time in prayer. Mm-hmm. And um, that, that was basically it. Mm-hmm. So we, we, didn't, there, we, we didn't have bells and whistles, really, you know. Um, Special times of the year, Christmas, we did a few extra things. Mm-hmm. We'd have an advent calendar, mm-hmm. you know, in which we had names of Jesus. It's amazing how many names of Jesus there mm-hmm. are. We put a different name of Jesus for each day of the month of December, things like that. But, mm-hmm. uh, but honestly, it was pretty simple. Mm-hmm. But, but we, we did do it pretty consistently with them. Not, not perfectly, I mean, we, mm-hmm. uh, but fairly consistently. Mm-hmm. And then as they did get older, then there were, we began looking for things that they could be involved in that would supplement what we were trying to do at home. My dad did that with me. He was so smart. Um, he, he, you know, his, his dad was an alcoholic. He was a horrible father. But when my dad became a Christian at 18 years old, he pleaded with the Lord if, if God would help him know how to be a Christian husband and father. And I know God answered that prayer. He just had instincts that uh, James Dobson was writing at the same time. It was amazing. Hmm. And one of the things my dad knew that he needed to do was, was supplement his instruction of his children with others who his children would, would be attracted to that would be able to, to contribute to their lives. So things like uh, camps and retreats and uh, um, group, group activities and things like that, he, he just really wanted to ensure that those things were on target and they would facilitate um, a, a supportive role in what they were doing at home. Mm-hmm. He sent me to, you know, Campus Crusade for Christ in, in uh, 
um, shoot, uh, Arrowhead, Arrowhead Springs um, a couple times when, when I was a young teenager uh, just to get that training down there and, uh, you know, sent, sent me, I mean, it's hard to believe this now, but sent me around the world when I was 15 years old to visit missions places mm -hmm. um, and uh, all, all for the purpose of exposing me to missionaries and God, God's work in different places in the world. I spent most of that time in one country, but uh, I went to a dozen different places. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just, he, he was always looking for ways in which um, we, we could be connected with others who would um, provide more incentive for following the pathway that he, he knew we needed to go. Mm -hmm. So he, he didn't think of himself as, it's just me, you're gonna get it just for me, you know, mm -hmm. but he, he wanted to get these others to participate in that. Mm. So I think that's a good idea. We did that with our own kids as well, trying to look for people and places that they could be connected with that would be good good for them. Mm. Amen. Amen. So, that's yeah. very helpful, Dr. Ware. Um, this one's along um, the topic or theme of worship. Um, obviously, we know that all of the Christian life is about worship. But talk about the implications of a high view of God for both our corporate Sunday morning gathering. Why do you think Sunday mornings, um, piggybacking off of that, is becoming less and less of a priority for Christians in our day and age? Mm. Maybe in connection even with the view, high view of God, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of expand on that, because there is a, you know, depending on where you're at in our country, there might be pockets of places where there's a high view of God and there's Sunday mm -hmm. morning worship is very important. Mm -hmm. um, but more and more families stay home Hmm. people maybe because of live streaming or whatever that was one of the things that the elders talked about recently oh. we went to live streaming it's like well mm -hmm. are we going to do that in light of the fact that people might stay back so we kind of shepherded our congregation through that encouraging them about these these are the reasons why mm -hmm. you, you could stay home and this is available to you but um, it's, it, it shouldn't take the place of the Sunday morning worship right. corporate right. gathering talk a little bit about that and what you've observed um, as far as the diminishing in the minds of people of what happens here on a Sunday morning. Yeah, I think, um, in, in, I, I mentioned this to the men over the weekend on Saturday, that in many of our churches, there is what I, I have come to call a rush to the divine imminence. Mm -hmm. The imminence of God meaning attributes of his love and kindness and his closeness, his forgiveness, his compassion, and so on. And those kinds of attributes are highlighted in our services in, in most churches. I mean, the love of God is, is kind of prominent in all of it. And of course, those attributes are true. But the problem is when we rush there, we neglect other aspects of God's glory, his, his greatness, his might, his power, his holiness, you know, that we just don't see uh, when we rush to the divine imminent. So there has to be uh, also an intentional effort in churches to see God as transcendent, to see him as great and glorious. And if not, we end up with a belittled view of God. Mm. You know, A.W. Tozer wrote The Knowledge of the Holy back in 1962. Uh, that's the book whose first sentence is what comes into our, into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So you might remember that famous statement. <clears throat> but, but in the preface of that book, he's, he he, he explains why he wrote this book. He said, the view of God entertained among evangelicals is so low, so beneath the dignity of God as to constitute idolatry. Hmm. So that was in 1962. And I think that on balance, things have not gotten better since then, but have gotten worse, except for pockets. You know, so John MacArthur, you know, influence that he's had. John Piper, influence he's had. Sovereign Grace, uh, you know, uh, Alistair Begg. I mean, there are some notable exceptions, as it were, with, with some really wonderful movements of people and churches. Mm -hmm. But across the board, across America, I would say most churches don't, still are not getting it. They, they don't have this lofty view of God. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, the people really don't, understand what worship is. They, they really see God in a utilitarian way. He's here to meet my needs. Uh, he's, he's here to, to support my life. And, and we, we don't understand the greatness and the glory. So I think we have to have a, an intentional effort to put before people 
you know, as my sermon this morning attempted to do, um, a, a God who is just so incredibly full and rich and glorious. We understand why we should worship him alone, why he deserves all of the glory, because he, he alone is worthy of receiving our praise and adoration. And our heart and hope and trust should be given to him because of his greatness. And uh, I think that that inspires people to come and worship and then trust and obey because they see God for the great God that he is. Mm. Uh, so I, I agree with those who are, are wanting very badly to restore a high view of God mm -hmm. in our churches mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. commend to people that as good for their souls and as uh, um, providing resource for their day-by-day -day faith and hope in God. Mm. So you just said that day-by-day -day faith uh, from a high view of God to the way that we live very practically. Would you agree, disagree, maybe speak a little bit to sometimes in our in our life, there's this disconnect between people who will say, well, it's, it's about the vertical relationship with the Lord, and it's, we need to be walking with God, uh -huh. practicing the spiritual disciplines as, as God's means of grace for growth in Christ. So there's an emphasis on the, on the, the vertical, right? Um, and that devotion of the Lord, but oftentimes a disconnect as far as what the implication is for the, the, mm. our love for one another. Right. So talk a little bit, Dr. Ware, of the, how our high view of God very practically impacts our Christian community, our right. ecclesiology, right? right? Right. Yeah, so again, God, God has, I mean, amazingly designed so much of what takes place in us to happen in us, to happen in us through the ministry of others. Mm. He didn't have to design it that way, mm. but he did. He did, and, and so, I mean, so he didn't have to design missionaries to go out to the mission field, but he did. Mm -hmm. This is how, how he has chosen to do it, and he didn't design that, that we are edified by, by the ministry of one another, but he did. Mm -hmm. He could have just done it all, right? But instead, he, he, mm -hmm. he built into the way in which we thrive as human beings. Mm -hmm. We thrive only through interconnectedness Mm. with one another. Mm. So, so the, the, the one another text, I just taught at my own church in Louisville this past Wednesday night. I did a six-part series on Wednesday nights on the church. And the last one I did was on service in the mm. church. And I went through every single one another text in the New Testament. There's probably uh, 50 of them, maybe 50 or so. And categorize them so, so you know, I could kind of teach them in a way that would make sense of them. Um, and it just was amazing to me. It was so revealing to me how, how much God has in, invested in us being together mm. and, and how we are really harmed. We, we, we are depleted when we are not drawing from each other strength and, and encouragement and, and rebuke sometimes you know, challenge sometimes. Uh, there are lots of ways in which the one another's are to work together, but here's the commonality with all of it, to help one another grow in Christ. Mm -hmm. so, so that all of those gifts, all of those, those ministries to one another serve the ultimate purpose of us growing to be more like Christ. Mm -hmm. But it's so clear from the New Testament that God designed his work to happen in our lives through others into us and us into others. You know, so all of us, when we, when we come to church, we ought to think of ourselves in, in two categories. One as givers, where we all have something to give because God has given us gifts by which we are to contribute to the body. And the body is, uh, honestly, is uh, um, hampered, hurt, uh, if, if we don't contribute those gifts to others, so we, we should think of ourselves as givers, and we should think of ourselves as receivers, as those mm -hmm. who are open to receive from others what they have to, to help us with in the body of Christ. And my, my own experience is, I think most of us come with one mindset or the other. You know, the pastor will come as the giver, you know, and others, others will think of themselves as the givers, and then many people will think of themselves as, as the receivers, you know. But honestly, we all ought to think of ourselves in both ways mm. and, uh, and see that ministry of the body 
uh, function much more richly and fully in forming us to be more like Christ. Mm. Amen. I'll never forget at a former church sitting down with a, a couple that this couple was as faithful as can be, mature, mm. people would go to them for counseling. And yet meeting with them, it became very evident that they felt isolated. Mm. They didn't really have relationships. People would come to them for that. And um, a lot of it really, obviously it always comes back to the ecclesiology. They, they really weren't spending time with people just to get to know for relationship, mm. obviously leading to growth in Christ. Mm. And so I really appreciate what you just said about that connection that our high view of the Lord and our devotion before him should flesh itself out and even the way that we love one another. Absolutely. Right? Yep. Okay. All right, we have another question about um, um, you, you personally as an adult. Somebody is asking, what led you to attend seminary above other options with your life? Mm. Mm. Well, cer certainly uh, seminary is not um, the pathway for every Christian. Uh, by, by no means is that the case. Uh, uh, most people are going to be involved in vocations where they... They represent the Lord in that line of work that they have. My father was a businessman and represented Christ just really well mm. as, as a business. Shared the gospel regularly. Um, you know, so that most of us are in those categories, but there are some that God will call into um, what we think of as full-time ministry. And uh, then I think it's really important to prepare well, and seminary is a tremendous resource for us uh, in our day and age that we have these mm. seminaries out there. Um, f for my own life, I felt a very strong call to ministry. It was undeniable. I, mm. I just really could not have done anything else. Mm. I knew that the Lord uh, wanted me to be involved in, in some kind of ministry. When I first went to seminary, I didn't know whether it was to be a pastor uh, or to be a missionary. I was very, very open to, to that. I really didn't think teaching, per se. That I was thinking pastor or missionary. Mm. Um, but then as time went on, I had opportunities to preach and teach, and I really felt my main gifting was in teaching. I felt like a fish dropped, oops, a fish dropped wow. right, right, right at that right moment, right something. That. Right as you did. <laughs> a fish dropped into a tank of water, just swam. That's how I felt uh, teaching was for me. And I loved it, I still do, and... So it, it was definitely the right, the right thing to do. I think if you are, if you do sense the Lord wants you to be involved in, um, in, in ministry of the word to people in some capacity over, over the long haul, then going, going to seminary is a really good thing to do. Mm. Uh, because, you know, most churches just cannot provide what a seminary provides with, with experts in Greek and Hebrew and you know, New Testament, Old Testament, and church history and theology, and, mm -hmm. and also some of the practical areas as well of counseling and preaching and so on. Um, and that, that's what seminaries can provide. Now, having said that, not all seminaries are equal, right? Mm -hmm. So a place like Masters is a very good place to go uh, here very close to you. Uh, Southern, where I mm -hmm. teach now, mm -hmm. is no question one of the finest uh, mm -hmm. options available for mm -hmm. people today. Uh, the Lord has done an amazing work at Southern Seminary mm. over a couple decades to mm. make it what it is today. And it's mm. uh, uh, I mean, just a marvel. Uh, I, I just am astonished at what God has done and consider it a great privilege to be there. Mm. Um, but I would, there's some, some I would not recommend. I'm not going to say them here publicly, but uh, there's a lot I would not recommend, to be honest. Mm, uh, those are two that I would, though. You know, yeah, Masters and, uh, and Southern Good choices. And I will say it for you, Southern is an excellent seminary, uh -huh. as Masters is an excellent seminary. Yeah, that's right. Do you believe, piggybacking off of that question, um, I know some young men here in the past, we've had conversations about the internal call to full-time vocational uh -huh. ministry, we would call it. How do you know yeah. if God has called you as a young man to full-time vocational ministry? I know we're all called to minister. You've said that in yes. as believers. But then that, 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 for the sake of conversation, how do you know, Dr. Ware? Yeah. How do you know? Uh, part, part of it is by the um, confirmation or lack thereof of people who know you well. Mm. You know, so I, I do think there is some, some real uh, value that we ought to attach to the folks who know you the best. 
and if they're godly people walking with the Lord, have, have a spiritual you know, life with the Lord, um, if, if they really struggle with seeing you as a pastor or a teacher or something like that, that, that would be, I think, a reason for questioning whether, whether the Lord's calling you in that direction. But on the other hand, if they have seen you, you know, teach a Sunday school class or something and they, they think that the Lord really has gifted you in it, that's encouraging, mm-hmm. I think. But ultimately, I think there is a sense, there is this inner call, this sense of what God has uh, given you a heart for that you just can't um, neglect. Mm-hmm. I, 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 you know, the, what happened to me was something that it was so strong, I could not fathom not going into the ministry. Mm-hmm. I just really felt I had to. Um, and so I think that was from the Lord and it was confirmed then by opportunities I had to, to do a few things in ministry. Mm-hmm. So it, it does come with external confirmation, but I think there, there is something that you have to have a very strong sense from the Lord that this is what he wants for you. Yeah. All right, so we really want to pick your brain on um, just uh, theologians that have impacted your life, dead ones, live ones, okay? Uh-huh. Sorry, was that not very <laughs> reverent? You know what I mean by that, yeah. right? Um, brothers that obviously are no longer alive but ra- wrote great works, mm-hmm. um, brothers who are still alive, who yes. are great contributors to your thinking, um, and maybe along the lines of that, talk to us about the importance of reading in addition to, to God's word, obviously, first and mm-hmm. foremost, good theology. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Well, personally, A.W. Tozer's book, The Knowledge of the Holy, uh, stands head and shoulders above anything else for me, just because that's the book that God put into my hands at a time in my life, at the end of my freshman year of college, when I was having a crisis experience of whether I should follow the God of my parents, was that the true God or not? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and through that experience that I had, um, the Lord brought that book to me uh, and oh my goodness, I've never been the same since. I read that book and it just utterly uh, transformed me within one day. I was just uh, astonished at who God is. So really, what I'm doing today in many ways is the outworking of what God did in me uh, when I was 19 years old at the end of my freshman year of college. So I, that, that book, I uh, just, you know, personally is, is uh, in a category of its own. But then, you know, so many books in the Reformed tradition I have found so very helpful. Uh, John Piper's books, I actually like his, his preaching better than the books myself. Mm-hmm. You know, I've listened to so many series mm-hmm. uh, that John Piper has preached. Um, I got to know him back before he was famous, what, before Desiring God had been published, because I, my first teaching position was at Bethel Seminary, started in 1984, and, uh, and John Piper and I got to be friends back then. Mm-hmm. And uh, then when I left Bethel, um, I started listening to his sermon tapes on cassette, and you ask, what is that? What yeah. is that? With, with a, a Walkman, Sony Walkman. Do you remember those? Mm-hmm. Yeah, great little machines. So I listened to so many, many, many uh, John Piper sermons, and those, boy, those were so building to my, my faith, and uh, I'm grateful for that. But books, books by John Piper are just excellent. Uh, I would say, you know, Packer, J.I. Packer, Don Carson, mm-hmm. uh, Sinclair Ferguson, uh, the, these are people who write things that are really worth reading, you know, just thoughtful Christian people. Then, you know, historically, again, I think the Reformed tradition is, is the most valuable. Um, pe- people like, you know, John Murray and, and uh, John Owen and, and John Calvin. Boy, there's a lot of Johns, aren't there? John MacArthur, John Piper, John Owen, John, you know, wow, John Calvin. Um, makes, you, make you, makes you wish your name was John. Yeah. yeah. So, I, you know, I think that's the, the richest tradition, and then kind of, kind of reaching back, early church, Augustine, you know, his mm-hmm. confessions. Um, City of God is a tough read, I'll just be honest with you. Yeah. The first half of that huge book is all about the pagan religions of the, the Greco-Roman world of his day, and it mm-hmm. is so confusing, you know, I mean, that's tough. But the second half of City of God is much easier and and, and really insightful. So, I mean, you know, there's a lot of really good mm. material out there. 
Mm. Um, yeah. In your daily study, uh, obviously in the Word and then reading good theology, in addition to that, what would you say is important for a, um, a believer in our day and age to surround himself with as far as literature? What would you recommend? Yeah, you know, part, part of that just depends on your own inclinations and, mm -hmm. and interests. Um, but I do think a, a regular reading of, of good theology, you know, my wife Jody is a reader, and I know that she is, has grown so much in her Christian life precisely because 25, 30, 30, no, 30 years ago, uh, she changed her reading diet. She was reading a lot of women's stuff back then that was, you know, okay, but it wasn't edifying to her soul. And she switched at that point to start starting to read, you know, cr Christian, Christian books that uh, we knew would be from good people and so on. Mm -hmm. She's read everything that David Paulison has written, by the way, you know. So Dave, David Paulison is, boy, one of the best out there for, you know, Christian counseling and, and understanding of your human nature and so on. And she's read everything by, you know, that the CCEF people have put out and and I, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I told her, read, read Sinclair Ferguson. So she's read everything by Sinclair, mm -hmm. Sinclair Ferguson. You know, I just, and, and to see the impact on her life is just remarkable, how that has really affected her whole worldview and outlook. And, and so, I, you know, I, I have seen this firsthand with Jody. For me, it's, I, I go back to my teenage years where I started reading that way. Mm. But... Uh, um, I, I do think those things are really, are really the most important. But then, goodness, you read stuff for fun too, don't you? You know, so may, maybe some novels. I, I think I told some context somewhere that I love historical fiction. Mm -hmm. So Very like uh, Leon Uris's book, The Exodus, is one of my very favorite novels that I've read. Um, and uh, Kayam Potok's The Chosen. Uh, and just, you know, wonderful novels that teach you something about the history of the time period also. Mm -hmm. And biographies, biographies are so mm -hmm. valuable. Uh, I'm just finishing reading the two volume Spurgeon autobiography that Banner of Truth published. And oh my goodness, that has been fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, just earlier, I, I finished reading the three volume uh, William Manchester uh, biography on Churchill. Oh my land, how fascinating that was. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, there are just some wonderful things to, mm -hmm. to read um, in biographies out there that are both, both instructive his, historically, mm -hmm. but also if they're Christians, can really edify your soul. I read a biography on Thomas Cranmer, you know, the famous Anglican, the one who started Anglicanism in England, uh, very faithful Christian and uh, Boy, so many lessons I learned from that. So, you know, great stuff out there mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. uh, take in, so. Awesome. Well, can we give Dr. Ware a round of applause? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have, uh, we've really worked him. Friday night, he spent some time with the <laughs> elders and wives and uh, a few other families, and Saturday, the men's conference. Right. And he did three sessions plus a Q&A with the men. And then obviously this morning, thank you for the blessing of a wonderful ministry well, of the Well, you're so word. welcome. I, I have felt yeah. so, so uh, welcomed here by you. Uh, the, the Lockies who hosted me have, have just, uh, you know, rolled out the red carpet. Mm. Their breakfast this morning. Wow, I'll tell you. So, you know, just uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for <laughs> the, the friendship that I feel okay. with you mm. and your kindness to have me here. So thank you so much. Amen. Thank you, sir. Don't forget, I'm going to pray for us. And uh, we have the Munch and Mingle in room one. Okay. Uh, just a time of fellowship together, so let's go and enjoy that, uh, all right? Let me pray for us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so overwhelmed by your majesty and your splendor and the fact that you are a God who is transcendent, um, above and beyond anything that we can even imagine, Lord. Our finite minds can't even understand you. And yet you have chosen out of the, out of your love and mercy and grace to be amongst us even in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for your transcendence and your eminence, your nearness to us. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to continue to grow in our, in our heightened view of you and that that would flesh itself out, Lord, in the way that we even love one another, the way that we care for one another, as Dr. Ware just reminded us. Father, we thank you for your servant. We thank you for um, Dr. Ware and his life and his dear wife, um, 
Jody and the work that you've done of grace in their hearts and lives. Thank you for the impact that they've had, Lord. And as he said, Father, we are all ultimately, Lord, just a, a, um, an evidence of your grace. There's nothing good in any of us, and yet you have, out of the overflow of your love, chosen to use us, Lord, and ministry is a privilege. And I thank you that they have that perspective. I pray that we would continue as a church, uh, Lord, to see ministry as a privilege, Lord, uh, as leaders and as your people, and that, Father, you would use us to impact this world for the exaltation of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Scripture quotations taken from the New American Standard Bible, copyright by the Lockman Foundation.